Good. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for the time. Thanks for joining uh, today's webinar. So today we'll focus on, uh, let's say, uh, exploring the role of ESG factors into the fixing income investing process. Uh, voilà. So my name is Jean-Claude Bertolot. I'm a director of Corporate Solutions, and I will be the moderator of today's uh, session. Uh, for some background, let's say, uh, on our side, uh, um, we, uh, we're, we're, I'm, I'm part of the Corporate Solutions team at Societex, uh, a division of Societex, and a broader, let's say, part of the broader uh, Morningstar uh, family. So our role on our side, we're most famous for providing uh, second party opinions, as well as enabling corporates to, to, to license or to, let's say, to leverage the existing uh, ESG ratings we have on them for different allowed use cases, some of them linked to, to financial uh, instruments. So really a role there really on the markets really to provide corporates with the right insights and solutions, either to label the associable uh, bonds or loans issuances, uh, or to promote more broadly the sustainability efforts in a credible uh, way. So before going further into the topic of today, uh, I would like to introduce the panelists that will be together with me today. So uh, let's start uh, ladies first. We'll be joined today by Heather Lang, Executive Director of, uh, of our, our Corporate Solutions uh, Systematics. Jean-François Veron, Managing Director, Credit and ESG Rating Advisory from Société Générale. Thanks for joining uh, Jean-François. Andrew Lin, Managing Director at DPRS Morningstar. Uh, welcome, Andrew. And Jose Luis Blasco, uh, Global Systemic Director at Acciona. Um, so I would like to yeah, have our panelists uh, introduce themselves for a few minutes, um, uh, for a couple of minutes. Heather, would you like to, to start? Sure, thanks, John Claude. Um, so, as as John Claude mentioned, um, I'm on the corporate solutions team, and and he's updated you on on some of the things that uh, that we are involved in here at Sustainalytics. It's been a, a fast growing uh, business unit in the company and a fast growing market. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, my background is I've I've been at Sustainalytics actually for for 17 years, so so one of the pioneers um, in this space, and I've worked on the ESG rating side of the business on client relations and uh, and um, on corporate solutions uh, for the last four years and really looking forward to the panel today thank you Andrew over to you great hi there uh, I'm Andrew Lin and I'm the managing director for infrastructure power and utilities in the uh, corporates rating group over at uh, DBS Morningstar um, and uh, in addition to that I also work on ESG initiatives here at the, uh, the credit rating agency. Uh, specifically, I'm on the ESG methodology group. And so uh, we created a, a, a methodology in, to uh, describe how we would take a look at uh, ESG. And uh, this is really from the viewpoint of how it impacts the company, uh, as opposed to more of the sustainability side of things. Um, yeah, and uh, I've been with uh, DBS Morningstar for, for seven years now. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Jean-François, do you want to present uh, yourself? Jean-François, I'm afraid you muted. Maybe we'll 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 uh, we'll have to start with Jean-Louis uh, uh, from from Axiona, uh, while Jean-François we find a, a solution for the for the line. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jean Claude. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Jose Luis Blasco. I am the Global Head of Sustainability in ACCIONA. I was uh, also part of the tech, of the technical expert group of the European Commission for the taxonomy. Um, uh, and, and very, very proud to, to, to talk about the experience of ACCIONA because ACCIONA is a very unique company. It's not an infrastructure company diversifying energy, it's not an energy company with a legacy of construction. Is a very uh, um, um, a straightforward to sustainability solution from since since two decades, and uh, I'm happy to to go in depth about the experience to integrate into the strategy of a company, a very complex company, the sustainability factor. Thank you, Jose Luis. So I'm not sure if we managed to 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 solve the line the issue line of uh, the line issue. Sorry, of Jean Francois. Do you, do you hear me, Jean Claude? Yes, you're on. I was gonna present yourself on behalf of yourself, but I think it's better we hear it from your own uh, words. 
Do, do you hear me, Jean-Claude? Now, yes. Go ahead. Okay, good. Sorry, Jean-Claude, hi, everyone, and sorry for that. Uh, thanks for inviting. It's a real pleasure to be on this panel. So I'm a managing director at Société Générale in charge of rating advisory, uh, both in credit and ESG. Uh, in the past, I spent a couple of years at S&P and uh, before that at Accenture. So uh, in essence, uh, we are helping our client manage, um, that means improve, defend, or optimize their credit and ESG ratings. Um, in, in credit ratings, that is helping them in uh, fast-moving uh, situations like uh, new ratings, uh, uh, IPOs, LBOs, or uh, M&A. And ESG, it's a bit uh, more... Uh, uh, it's a bit different. Uh, so we have developed a digital tool, uh, which I believe is uh, pretty smart uh, to help our clients understand and improve their ESG ratings and compare them with peers. And uh, we also accompany them in a context of sustainable uh, finance processes. So, for example, when discussing with SPO providers uh, like uh, Sustain Analytics. Thank you, Jean-François. And great, yeah, and great to hear. Your, your, your voice. <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot. So I think we have, uh, we've, we've presented the, the panelists so we can uh, deep dive directly into the, into, the, into the topic. So as a reminder, today we, we really, let's say, try to, 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 to deep dive into the, you know, how equity, let's say, has, has been is focusing on uh, an integrating ESG consideration a part of the investment decision-making process since uh, a while, right? And, and how this moved into, into the fixed income uh, uh, space. Uh, what are the ESG factors that one is, you know, needs to assess when assessing corporate credit risk, uh, bond selection or other related uh, activities. So this webinar aims to, to offer insights into the variety of ESG risk-based research, which we'll see is pretty much different. It can have different uh, approaches. ESNG credit analysis available to fix fixed income investors and how fixed income investors are leveraging ESNG information. Is it the same, different than the equity investors or the type of investors? And how material ESNG credit risks impact the financial profile of a company, how corporation using sociability information as part of the strategy and uh, and the you know the trans the transition the, the let's say the, the transformation uh, themselves as a as a corporate so uh, broad uh, very broad let's say uh, topics to cover today I think will be very interesting um, to start off uh, Heather um, I would like to ask you a question what is what is driving this explosive growth on the sustainable finance market that we're seeing and in particular uh, sustainability bonds and ESG ratings. What's your perspective um, from your side? Sure. Um, so I think the explosive growth is is really driven by broader global trend towards uh, towards the expansion and mainstreaming of, of ESG that we're observing. Um, we are see, we're expecting. I've, I've seen figures that expect sustainable assets under management forecast to surpass fifty trillion by twenty twenty five, and ESG ratings are are key you know factors um, inputs underpinning underpinning those assets under management. Meanwhile, on the sustainable debt finance side, um, we're seeing a similar trajectory, um, surpassing $3 trillion in cumulative issuance in, in 2020 um, for that part of the market, and with forecast that $1 trillion will be issued in green social and sustainability bonds in 2021 alone. And so I think some of the key drivers that, uh, that are really impacting this are um, a, a wave of regulatory developments um, that have been happening both globally across different regions and, and really with an emphasis on um, the low carbon transition. We're seeing taxonomies and labels for green financial products. ESG reporting requirements, which was a really big topic at uh, at COP26, um, and uh, and so more de um, more standardization, if you will, or you know, or efforts to to harmonize um, what's already happening in that in this market, and and also a maturing and a sophistication of the market. 
We're seeing new instruments, including KPI linked instruments, um, bonds and loans uh, that link general purpose financing to sustainability performance targets and, and KPIs. Uh, we're seeing transition financing, which is also helping to, to grow the tent and, and allow um, companies from, from industries with, with hard to abate activities um, to, to enter the sustainable finance tent. And all of this is, is underpinned by this heightened sense of, sense of urgency around the need to transition to a low carbon economy, um, which I think we've all felt um, really strongly in the last couple of weeks and in the lead up and, and during the COP26. And, uh, and for that, you know, the role um, that financial institutions and investors can play in, in, um, in solving um, some of the problems we face by channeling pools of capital towards such efforts. Thank you. This leads me to, to, to maybe a side, side question uh, uh, to, to, still to you, uh, Heather. Uh, let's say, how common is it for, for issues to seek, uh, to seek third party opinions from uh, SPO, ESNG providers when they seek capital, when they want to issue? Uh, you know, this was not necessary in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. So how has this changed over, over, the, over, the, over the last uh, quite recent years? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's just something I've definitely observed over over my time here. I remember, you know, having to when I we were doing the ESG ratings and and having to really chase down companies to to get them to engage with our research process. That is not the case anymore. I think companies are really engaged, both companies that we've been tracking for for many years as part of our ESG research process are, you know, becoming increasingly in, engaged and and uh, proactively sharing information and um, around their ratings and, and their sustainability performance. We're also seeing other companies that, uh, that haven't been rated in the past coming to us and saying, we want an ESG rating. And many of those are private companies or, or mid-cap companies and really recognizing um, the, um, the advantage um, to being rated. And, and I think that really coincides with, with some new use cases for, for ESG ratings among companies. Um, not only can they use it to, um, you know, for to build external profile around their sustainability initiatives, uh, they can use it to inform internal strategy and targets to assess ESG risks in the supply chain, and of course, most notably to to access capital and uh, and link those ratings to sustainability linked loans or bonds, for example. And so, so that's on the rating side, and and then on the on the bond side, um, while well, second party opinions are, are still not mandatory. I mean, it really has become market practice um, for any issuer um, that is developing a, a green social or sustainability bond framework to seek out a credible um, second party opinion provider. I think investors are expecting to see that and, and it really attests to the credibility of the, of the issuance. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, Andrew, from, from your side, let's say, how, how has the ESNG area, how has it evolved, let's say, and how, what are your clients now inquiring about now versus a few years ago? Because I would imagine uh, things change a lot on your side already, as well at uh, DBRS. Yeah, certainly. Um, and certainly, before I start, though, I think I'd like to de define what ESG means to us from a credit rating agency, because really, we are taking a look at ESG credit risk factors, and these risk factors are uh, how they impact the, the company. So as opposed to what's more commonly um, uh, talked about in terms of sustainability and what, how companies may impact the world or society, we're really taking a look at uh, how the world and society really impacts the company uh, themselves from more of a financial point of view. So for instance, as opposed to trying to take a look at what the, uh, the company's impact would be on climate change, it's more about climate change impact on the company, either through more volatile weather or through erosion of the, 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 the lands or, or flooding and things like that. And so uh, really it's more about then, uh, th these are um, the, the, the factors from a credit point of view. We don't actually do ESG credit, we don't do ESG ratings, but we take a look at ESG credit factors along with a whole bunch of other credit factors and how it affects the, um, the company. Now with respect to ES and G, uh, we've always done the G part in terms of governance. Uh, governance has always been a, a key credit driver for, for companies, but more and more, uh, the, uh, the E part of it, especially the environmental impacts and environmental, environmental credit risks have really come to the forefront. And so trying to, uh, to bring that up to a higher profile and to talk about it 
about these type of uh, um, environmental risks, um, climate risks, uh, those are really um, what is starting to uh, become more uh, prevalent uh, as climate change becomes uh, more and more of a, a near and present danger. Thank you, Andrew. So completely agreeing with you, ESG ratings uh, are completely different from, let's say, uh, assessing ESG elements within a cre credit rating. So that's that's a good transition to my next question to to, to Jean Francois on the on the on the rating uh, advisory side. Uh, Jean Francois, I would imagine a few years back, I don't know how many um, your your activities were mainly oriented towards towards credit ratings, uh, potentially already integrating a part of ESG. So. How how are the ESG elements increased over the years, right? Uh, within the credit ratings, right? So we're really measuring risk of defaults. And how do you see on the side the rise of ESG ratings and and how do they sit aside basically both both type of of, of, of ratings? So for it seems we lost you again. So it used to work. I don't know what you did before, but do the very same thing. <laughs> yes, you did it. Better? Yes. Okay. So, so, so. Uh, and you're gone again. So it must be really a, 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 a miscontact on your mic. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now I know I need to have the phone and the actually uh, the zoom on the same uh, at the same time. So it's a bit strange, but that's one. That's fine. Well, so, anyways. So we're saying that the. The ESG dimension has become a key component, so, and really in two ways. First, ESG is now a real part of traditional uh, credit analysis, and uh, Andrew uh, mentioned that. And second, ESG ratings, are, I mean really uh, pure ESG ratings, are increasingly important. And, and you're really well placed to uh, observe it, uh, uh, Jean-Claude. So, so first, ESG in, uh, in ratings, in credit ratings, uh, so all the credit rating agencies, so DBRS, S&P, Moody's, Fitch, are now incorporating those factors into their uh, analysis. Um, not all the ESG factors now, uh, just those which are relevant to credit uh, uh, analysis. And um, if I look, if I try to make a quick difference, I would say that it would be four main differences in the way to uh, look at ESG factors trying to distinguish uh, credit and uh, pure ESG. So first is financial materiality, then the number of data points, the horizon of the analysis and for the process. So just uh, quickly in turn, financial materiality, um, credit rating agency would just look at uh, those factors which are really visible where there's a kind of consensus. Whereas the uh, ESG rating agencies would look uh, at the materiality for all stakeholders. Um, the, for example, the ESG rating agencies would incorporate into their analysis uh, uh, some uh, factors such as uh, health and safety or biodiversity, which you wouldn't find in a, a normal, I would say, uh, credit, uh, uh, credit rating. Um, less data points. So the second point, I think that uh, for a, uh, a pure player, you would have uh, up to really several hundreds of data points. This is what we see at uh, Sustainetics. And by the way, uh, congratulations, because uh, I think that in terms of uh, data, there is a real transparency at Sustainetics, and uh, really it's a great help uh, uh, for us. For a credit rating agency, I think that at best, uh, for the ESG factors, that would be a several dozens, really at best. Uh, governance. If you take governance, for example, that would be totally uh, different. The, this is a real discipline at uh, Sustainetics and uh, other uh, ESG rating agencies. You would have some uh, tricky things uh, for credit analysts, like, for example, uh, looking at boards and uh, trying to understand the kind of clusters you may have, quality and integrity. That wouldn't, you wouldn't find really uh, many comments on this in a credit, uh, credit, uh, uh, rating, uh, uh, credit rating analysis. Um, third, the term of the analysis, it's much longer for an ESG rating agency, so it, they try actually to uh, distinguish long-term trends, uh, even if they spot, they use spot or backward-looking uh, uh, data and some kind of low-intensity signals. 
but sometimes it's very short term with, uh, for example, the controversies, which are uh, arguably uh, high intensity signals. And last point, process. So there's uh, much more interactions uh, still at, with the credit rating agencies, even if we can observe some improvement. And again, congratulations, uh, uh, I think, to Sustainetics, you're uh, uh, improving your level of uh, interaction with corporates and, uh, uh, and insurers more generally. And I think this is really uh, something which is uh, extremely positive uh, uh, for, uh, for the companies, for us, for the quality of the, uh, of the analysis. So these would be really the main uh, the main differences uh, I would see, Jean-Claude. Thank you, Jean-François. Exactly. And on your last comment, is th thanks a lot. And we say also for the quality of the of the SNG ratings provided to the investor clients, which were the only ones interested at the beginning in those uh, in those SNG ratings, and still are, of course, uh, even more so. Uh, but I would say more engagement, more interaction with the corporates also brings. Um, yeah, more insights, more value, more more better ratings to uh, to investors. Um, let's move let's move a bit towards uh, a topic which is um, I mean you've heard probably a lot, but I would think some of the perspective from our panelists will be will be quite unique uh, when we assess uh, ESNG and uh, let's say. Uh, and materiality, right? What is material for, for ESNG? How to assess materiality? How to measure it? Uh, so I think we'll go into the direction. So I'd like to 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 ask Heather again uh, on this first this first question. Um, I mean, so on sustainability size, how how do you do right? How do you measure the risks, the essential risks of, of of companies, and how are fixed income investors making use of ESG ratings on corporates? Yeah, so Sustainalytics uh, approaches a materiality focused um, rating. It's a it's our it, our flagship rating is our ESG risk rating. It has a two dimensional approach that we use to assess a company's level of unmanaged ESG risk, and so those dimensions include the the exposure that the company faces to um, to ESG um, ESG risks, and that will that will relate to the sub industry that it's operating in, to to the regions that it's operating in. Um, to its unique business model. And then we're also looking on, on the other hand at how well the company is, is managing that exposure. And so, you know, the higher the exposure and, uh, and the specific areas that that exposure, um, you know, we expect to see a commensurate amount of, uh, of management and, and risk mitigation from the company. And so our overall ESG risk rating reflects that level of unmanaged risk, and it reflects it across um, five categories from negligible to severe. Um, so the lower the, ra um, the, lower the rating, um, the lower the risk, um, the better. And so some of the key building blocks to our ratings include um, material ESG issues or factors that, uh, that will vary um, for, per sub industry, uh, depending on, on where that exposure is most significant. So we're, you know, to name a few examples, we could talk about human capital, carbon, uh, resource use to name a few. And, uh, and then corporate governance is that foundational pillar that we'll look at across all sectors and um, for all public companies and their adjustments um, are made to, to weightings and such more at the, at the regional level. And, and our ratings are used by fixed income investors to assess the securities of an issuer. And, uh, and they can be rolled up to the portfolio level. They can be looked at alongside our country risk ratings um, as, uh, as key inputs um, to, to fixed income uh, investor decisions. Our ratings are also part of, uh, of Morningstar's sustainability ratings for funds, um, helping investors uh, across all different asset classes uh, to measure portfolio level ESG risk. Thank you, thank you, Heather. So um, over to, to, to Andrew, I think you've touched up, uh, already a, a bit upon it on your, over your first, your first round of, of answers. Um, but let's say at the PRS Morningstar, um, how are you evaluating ESNG uh, credit credit risk factors as part of your credit uh, assessments? So what's what's the firm's what's the DBRS approach there? Yeah, and uh, let me talk about materiality because I think that's a good segue into answering your your question. When we take a look at uh, all the variables that would affect a credit rating and therefore affect the, the probability of default or the ability of the company to repay its debt, 
the, the threshold that we look at for materiality is really financial materiality. And uh, that bar is somewhat higher than taking a look at all types of uh, influence that may actually impact the, the company. And so when Jean-François Jean was saying that uh, we take a look at, from a credit rating agency, a lot less number of, uh, of different factors compared to what Sustainalytics will take a look at, that's absolutely true. Because from a financial materiality point of view, there is a much smaller subset of these factors. Now, these factors, whether they be ESG or not ESG, whether they be more from a competitive point of view, barriers to entry, uh, diversification, all of these other type of normal type of business uh, strategic factors that we would look at, they have the same sort of materiality bar that we also put in for ESG. So when we think about ESG credit risk factors, just like we take a look at other uh, non-ESG credit risk factors, the bar can be rather high. And so that's why for uh, a lot of the cases, a large number of the cases, when we think about sustainability, sustainability factors uh, and so those types of sustainability type risk, when you think about material, uh, financial materiality, a lot of times, they, the vast majority of the times, they don't have a material impact. So for instance, if a company misses its target for uh, its redu reduction of uh, its uh, uh, carbon footprint, it certainly would get negative feedback in, in, in press, uh, certainly on social media. But overall, when you think about uh, real impact from a financial point of view, it's not going to be much from, from that point of view in terms of a long-term, sustainable, and material financial impact. It's that more point. about uh, how the, the climate change thing would actually affect the company itself as opposed to the reputational type risks. The exception would be uh, in terms of uh, certain sustainability uh, targets uh, that are required from a regulatory point of view. So when we think about um, uh, carbon pricing or other type of EU type initiatives, uh, which are actually mandated and have financial penalties, those financial penalties uh, for missing those types of sustainability targets insofar as they are material would therefore have a, um, a, a financial impact and therefore we would see them as a, uh, a material ESG credit risk factor. And that's how our methodology uh, in terms of ESG plays out. It actually does um, focus more on the materiality aspect of, of uh, these particular factors. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so we'll continue by, by saying that normally we start webinars by mentioning to attendees, they can set the, send the questions on the Q&A session. Uh, I forgot to do this, so I'm going to do this in the middle. So please send your questions on the Q&A uh, little uh, section that you will find at the bottom of this Zoom session. And we are happy to go through some of those towards uh, towards the end. Um, next question brought, so uh, Jose Luis, don't, don't stress, we will come back uh, to you. I know I haven't <laughs> sent a question to you, to you yet. Uh, this one is still uh, for Andrew, Heather, and, and Jean-Francois. Um, I don't know who wants to, 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 to take it. I think it's a quite, quite, quite right, right broad question. Uh, how do you, how do you, do you, first, you, do you, do I say you, your companies uh, manage the different methodologies and approach towards mat materiality of ESG factors? This has been a very big topic. Uh, I have heard many, many discussions around it. So happy to see uh, your point of view on this. So that's for me, Jean Claude. I think it's you're probably most exposed to 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 provide well, a, a market-wide answer to the question, and and I can certainly talk of um, the other rating agencies. So, so so in in the previous questions and um, and, and also Andrew alluded to it, we we were explaining a bit the difference between uh, ESG and trade ratings and uh, the few players um, ESG rating analysis. Uh, here, um, that's more to um, uh, discuss, analyze, and try to understand the difference in uh, ESG uh, uh, rating. So that's true. Uh, we often hear, uh, and that's generally true, that there are significant differences uh, between ESG uh, uh, ratings. But uh, I I'll explain why that and why I guess it's uh, I it's fine nonetheless. So. Those differences are generally explained by data, criteria, and process. So if we start with data, as we know, the SG data is not standardized. It's not fully audited. 
And very interestingly, it's, it's not aggregated into one monetary dimension uh, as the accounting data would be. So it's more complicated. Uh, now, the good news, um, and I think either I mentioned it, so, uh, the IFRS Foundation announced uh, in Glasgow that they would create a new board to develop minimum sustainability disclosure requirements. So this is great news, and uh, we would certainly uh, welcome more information on climate uh, and forward-looking information on climate, like temperature rise, uh, critical uh, assessment of emission trajectories, uh, and taxonomy uh, uh, also. So that's the first point about uh, data. Maybe one more thing also which is interesting. Uh, it's maybe more criteria. That's the scale. For a credit rating, it's, it's pretty easy. A default is zero. It's bad. And a AAA is very good. Basically, you've already always paid on what you're expected to, uh, to pay your uh, financial obligations. For an ESG rating or an ESG for a company, it's much more complicated. What is a zero? What is a default? You don't have that. So basically, the, the way you're measuring this isn't clear. So the different rating agencies will have basically different scales. And then how do you aggregate that? For some, the E will be more important. For some others, the G or the S. Maybe a personal remark, uh, and I think that was mentioned also on this panel, the E these days look, the environmental aspects look very important with the net zero pledges and also because companies, if they want to transition, they will have to dedicate massive capex uh, to the change of their uh, uh, business. And lastly, process. Uh, for some companies, they are not respondent. For example, in a SAM process, if you're not respondent, you're losing some points. So basically, you will have a, a lower uh, uh, score. So with all this, it's different, but I think it's fine. You, you have different perspectives uh, that informs us of different uh, forms of analysis, these different uh, point of views. It, it's not as simple as credit uh, ratings, but still. Uh, I think it's uh, something that we can uh, live with, and I'm confident that with, with time, in any case, there will be some kind of convergence. And I'm happy to just jump in for a moment. I, I fully concur with everything that you've that you've just said, Jean Francois. So, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think that that with ESG, ESG factors are are typically associated with longer term impact on on risk return. Um, you know, I think that the time horizon is is a really key you know is a really key differentiator here when we're looking at ESG um, by by dedicated providers versus credit rating agencies. Um, you you know, I think that many, many issues play out over the longer term horizon. That said, I think we have seen ESG issues that um, that we've that have been perceived as potential longer term risks um, play out um, on a more kind of immediate um, immediate horizon. And so, you know, I think the way that the the, the way that the world is taking shape, um, you know, it, in many cases we don't know. And I think ESG ESG ratings are able to to take into consideration um, some of that uncertainty around both time horizon. And, and likelihood of, of an ESG um, risk taking, taking shape. And also to, to be able to take into consideration idiosyncratic um, issues um, that, uh, that may be sort of um, black swan events that, uh, that we, we haven't necessarily anticipated and to, to factor those into, into the ratings and, and the outlook on, uh, on a relatively immediate time horizon so that investors can, can make meaningful decisions on that basis. Um, I just want to add that, uh, you know, from an investor's point of view, Investor takes a look at a whole bunch of different factors, of which credit ratings are the credit strength of the uh, the borrower is just one of them. And so, uh, being able to invest in a responsible, sustainable manner that's also a very big component. Other factors in terms of liquidity, um, uh, liability uh, matching. There's a whole bunch of other factors uh, besides just uh, credit, which I think is is important. And I and I think that. Being able to marry uh, and integrate then both the sustainability side of considerations along with the credit side 
it's it's very important and it uh, gives a more mm -hmm. wholesome approach to uh, to the investor about the things that matter the most to those investors. Um, and uh, one can't just look at one side or, or the other. Uh, it's really about bringing everything together and but also recognizing how each of those components uh, uh, bring a different side of things uh, for consideration overall in that decision making process. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, and thank you, Andrew Jean-François, for 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 all those good uh, um, comments on this on this question. Um, I'll now uh, head towards uh, our dear uh, Jose, Jose Luis from from Acciona. Um, Jose Luis, from, from your side, from from an established uh, sustainability leader, I think in a corporate space, I think we can speak about that about Acciona. How do you leverage your ESG credentials, right, with various stakeholders, especially you know, internal, external? Um, and how do you manage corporate performance around ESG? So inside from the corporates, how does it happen? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, jean -Claude. Um, I think that we are in front of a, a transition. Um, the, the things are, are changing very quickly in these this, this years, but, but especially this year. Let me explain that ESG rating was a very useful tool during the last 10 years. We and all the companies who are engaged with the sustainability were um, um, sending questionnaire very complex to the ESG raters during years. We received 16 uh, questionnaires. You can imagine that I have people dedicated, fully dedicated to respond to the questions from the ESG raters. Uh, and during these years, the, the, the companies who are involved in the sustainability topics were always the same. The suspicious, the, 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 the current suspicious. We are always in the same uh, round tables. We, we are the same guys. We are learning the same. We are responding the same questionnaire. And this provoked a huge problem in the ESC raters. Why? Because the spread between the, all the companies in the same sector was tiny and tiny and tiny and tiny. And well, very difficult for the ESG raters to give you uh, a proper qualification for useful for the financing sector. Uh, and this is very, very key because now we have a huge and massive uh, uh, group of companies also embracing sustainability from the same point of view about how you are making things, about how materiality, that this is a word that I want to discuss also from the corporate side, the co-materiality, you should, you should respond to the material topics. And the GS ratings are looking for the, 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 your GRI and the TCFD and the TCFD 2.0 and the SASB and the another rate, another, commitment that you need to take. But at the end, the real impact of this is close to zero. I think, I think that the, 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 the fixed income is giving us the opportunity to make another approach. And I think that most of the ESG raters have realized another reality is what is important? What is more important? What is more impactful? How are you doing things that you have no clue, to be honest, because at the corporate level, you have not a real idea about what is the granularity at the site level? Or what are you doing? But this is very different. How are you performing and what are you doing? Because about what? And the taxonomy, I think, that gives you the opportunity to, to show more clearly without any uh, uh, narratives, without any history the, the, the behind that, is showing you how you are contributing in, in real terms to the transformation of the, of the, of the, of the, con, of the economy uh, in the sustainability way. And I think that this is, we are in this point. I say, for example, I, I say, for example, that the, the Greta Thunberg test. The Greta Thunberg test could be very useful for the financial sector. If you have, a, for example, the electricity, the utilities, the electricity utility sector, and you see, have a look to the ESG ratings of this, you think that if you 
take these these companies into a fund. Greta Thunberg will invest on this. The response is no. Why? Because the criteria that you are introducing in the ESG ratings is the business as usual. Every single rater in the world, not green or green, should take into account the things that you, you are asking for the corporates in the ESG ratings. But if you want to focus on the pure sustainability ratings or pure sustainability financial products, you need to focus on, on, on what are the companies doing. And I think that we are in this spot. I don't want to extend so much, but I think that the, the, the now the fixed income gives you the opportunity to look at the real thing that makes impact in the society. Know about the how that are always are committed in order to make the, our things better, to, 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 to embrace uh, or to introduce the, the risk factors in our performance or our systems. We need to integrate into the strategy and the strategy is shifting your, your company to another type of things that you are doing. If you, don't, if you are making the same things that you, are make, you, you made 10 years ago, the, the, all of the effort on sustainability in corporates will be near close to zero. We need to be focused on what the companies are doing, not only about how the companies are performing. And I think that this is the next frontier. And, and I think, for example, we, in the fixed income, we, we, we hire sustainability, for example, for our second party opinions, introducing taxonomy, giving an opinion about what we are doing. And the scrutiny in the first time is what we are doing. And the second time is how we are performing in, the, in this project. And I think that this is the next frontier about how you are making real impacts in the society. And this is our challenge to abandon the activities that don't contribute positively to the sustainability of the society. Not only to have the ISO 40001, or hey, I have the commitment of the zero, blah, 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 or, or what another um, um, uh, very fancy uh, initiative that we can embrace in Glasgow. By the way, I am in Glasgow here today, probably is because I am a very bit, a bit frustrated about the impact. <laughs> Sorry for that, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So I think maybe very interesting uh, insights. And I guess I guess one of the way uh, your security performance will be measured externally is is the success of your labeled fixed income insurance or let's say uh, or, or the evolution of, of equity. But internally, you as a company, when, when you measure your sustainability performance, how do you do about about, about that? Your own no. kind of sustainability self assessment, right? As actioner. No. Yeah, I, I think that we have, um, um, I, I joined uh, ACCIONA three years ago and from, from I was partner in KPMT assessing a lot of companies during years and I, 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 I was thinking about how to organize this in order to make some progresses. <laughs> and it, the, the, the question was, okay, you have one part of the sustainability should be, should be focused on the performance. You need to make it uh, better and and for us the ESG ratings give us the opportunity to have a very granular information about the, the different departments that, that nobody is nobody are assessing their their performance. For example, the the human resources comp, uh, teams or or the corporate citizenship or 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 the people who risk who is performing who is assessing these guys. ESG rating gives you a score for them. This is magic for, this is the first. It's giving you a very detailed performance measures. The second is, is about recognition. Uh, we use as a credential when we are making, for example, the, the road, in, in road shows, in the commercial relationship, when we are introducing ourselves for clients, we, we show that we are a very a committed company and the proof of concept is the, is the ESG rating. For us, it's very important. And the third, and the third now is because it's a business year opportunity. We are designing in, in, in our financing approach, the ESG factor as a part of our offer. We will try to get cheaper money for our, uh, our projects 
leveraging on green bonds or sustainability linked bonds. But related to these bonds, we are introducing features to make a, div a double impact to introduce into the, the, on, on the offers. Let me explain 30 seconds only. If you are uh, building a bridge in Philippines and you can go to this offer with a proposal of a bridge greener and cheaper, I think that you have a competitive advantage. In order to learn about how to make it cheaper and greener is a good exercise to uh, develop your own framework and your own SPO in order to provide the certainty to your client that this bridge will be almost greener and the investors, I hope, also consider cheaper. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Julius. And I think it's a, I mean, it's a very good segue to, to to my next question. Talk because you did mention access to lower cost of capital, right, or better priced uh, instruments. Uh, and that was my question to 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 Jean Francois, but I'm happy to run it to 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 both to both of you. Uh, and say, how do you? Is there a clear advantage, right, in terms of pricing for for issuing a sustainability bond uh, format from a cost perspective? And um, yeah, so first that, and can second question to this, can, can ESG consideration potentially improve or negatively impact uh, a credit rating? What's the impact for yeah. things? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thanks for the question, um, uh, Jean-Claude. Um, so so I, I'm not a DCM uh, specialist, but I asked my, uh, my colleagues about this, and I will answer briefly because I see uh, that the time is, is passing. So in short, the answer is yes, but so tighter issuance premiums, so a kind of greenium, uh, but this is not easy to, uh, to quantify because uh, the pricing of a bond depends on a myriad of factors, rates, volatility, market conditions, sectors, and, uh, and, and, and so on. But today, there is a real strong demand for green and sustainable financial uh, instruments. So basically, that's the very simple uh, law uh, of supply and demand uh, which, um, which applies. Uh, I think either I uh, mentioned one statistic, uh, which was um, the uh, 17 or 18 uh, percent of new, new issuances uh, today, which are green social uh, sustainability linked bonds. Uh, just one other. So it's a lot. But if you take the global stock of bonds, which is about 140 trillion of dollars, uh, actually the stock of uh, sustainable uh, bonds is just 1% of that. Um, so um, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a lot uh, in flow, but in stocks, this is still a bit, uh, well, it's small, but growing. Mm -hmm. in, my, in my opinion, I can give you uh, I, uh, two, two of my learnings. So uh, we are very active um uh issuer in the market during the, the last three years we have eight billion eight billion in 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 green financing um my reflection about that uh it's impossible to say how big is the green union because uh most of the green bonds are not green bonds really don't make nothing. There are no impact at all. They are play vanilla with painted by your banks by green. But at, behind this is, is not why you are demanding a greening for a play vanilla product. And the investors are very clear about that. What is the impact of this instrument? Zero. Why you are asking for a discount on that? This is the first. This is we need to clarify what is green and and you cannot be, you have not, you, you need to be clear that green is not light green, uh, medium green and dark green. No, no, no. This is making an impact, a real impact beyond the business as usual, because everybody who is, is making a new factory should be or must be more efficient than the other. This is, this, is, this is business as usual. What is the premium that you are demanding for that? The second is about why you are you are focused on demanding a, a, a spread on this. Can you measure 
if you have a good CEO or a bad CEO, what is the spread in your debt? You are, it's crazy. Why you need to? It's a it's a it's a, a myriad of things that are uh, impacting in the in the in the in the in the price. But I give you an example. Our last bone was a, a green bone, five hundred million euros, zero point three seven percent. 0.37%. It was our cheapest financing to oversubscribe five times. I think that if you design the, the products well in the solid companies, you have a better premium. Um, 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 and I think that this is the key. All to, to, to put all the, the, the green financing in the same bucket, is an error. I think that the investors are more and more sophisticated and can define and can can can, can uh, distinguish what is really making an impact. Now we are in infl the inflation of the e e European um, uh, regulation that will oblige more prudential protection or more pro pro coverage in in with banks about. Uh, for intensive uh, carbon intensive industries. And this is an inflection, but it's only uh, temporarily, not, 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 not permanent. In the future, the current green bonds will be play vanilla and everybody will uh, apply to, for the, or asking for the same green union and it makes no sense. Thank you, Jose Luis. I think, I think on, the, on your last concluding points there, you were already talking about the future. We're coming to, to, towards the end of, of a webinar. So this is the point I wanted us to focus on, uh, maybe with one minute 30 each, let's say. Uh, uh, so, so the landscape of, of this market evolved quite a bit over the last year. So actually, where do you see this industry ourselves uh, in a few years? Um, Andrew. Well, uh, I certainly see more integration between the, uh, the credit analysis side and the uh, ESG rating side. Um, as a lot of people know, uh, Sustainalytics and DBS Morningstar are now sister companies all under Morningstar Inc. And uh, we're always encouraged to, to work together uh, across our, uh, our, our sister companies. So I can certainly see us uh, from a presentation point of view presenting to the, uh, the, the readers, to, to uh, issuers, to to our clients and our stakeholders, uh, side by side, you know, our credit ratings along with sustainalytics uh, ESG assessments, um, because I think that's what the market is, is looking for. Uh, just like a lot of speakers have talked about today, uh, the the credit rating side is just one component of the consideration, uh, but then so is the ESG sustainability side as well. And uh, uh, for uh, investors, especially long term investors, uh, having the information in front of them in a kind of a coherent, uh, transparent manner, uh, wherever uh, they're coming from. So whether they come from uh, different uh, companies or whether there is one uh, company that actually presents uh, both sides together, mm -hmm. uh, it is important to, uh, to see the, the, the different aspects of what ESG means to, uh, to different people. Uh, so that can be considered uh, to, the, uh, to the investing public. Thank you. Who's next? I'm happy to jump in. Um, I think I'm a lot more optimistic about uh, about the the issuances that are taking place um, in the green social and sustainability bond space than than perhaps uh, Jose Luis is. Um, I think we're seeing uh, that the bar is rising a lot. Um, that uh, I think it's it, it's taken the market some time to to mature, um, but uh, but there's you know there's a, a an incredible amount of sophistication, innovation that is happening here. Uh, we're seeing that both on the use of proceeds sides, um, especially as we have taxonomies um, really clearly defining um, what uh, you know what qualifies as green and and where where to apply specific thresholds. Um, we're seeing um, we're seeing one thing I'm very excited about is is that we've worked on a handful of projects recently that have combined um, both a focus on use of proceeds and 
and, um, and sustainability linked financing. Um, so we're seeing that coming together of, uh, of focus both on, um, on the issuance and uh, the sustainability performance of the, of the issuer themselves. And so I, I am optimistic about uh, where sustainable debt finance is going and, and expect that it will continue to, to grow and innovate and mature. And then on the on the ESG rating side, um, I think you know we've talked a bit about about disclosure and reporting. We've talked about some you know some recent developments, including um, the announcement of the the International Sustainable um, Sustainability Standard Board. I think we'll start to see better disclosure and more consistent disclosure from from companies. And and as we do, um, I think that will really um, promote the integrity and of the of ESG rating. Ratings and, and investor confidence um, create some some more consistency there, and so you know, so I am excited about that development as well, um, and uh, and yeah, continue to expect that ESG ratings will be looked at alongside credit ratings, and that um, and that as ESG data becomes stronger, um, that uh, the ESG factors will become more systematically incorporated within credit ratings to the to the extent to which they they impact credit worthiness. Um, um, and Heather, I, so, sorry, jean Francois, in order to respond to Heather, because I am also fully aligned with his comments about the optimism. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I think that you are right. I, I um, the, 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 all the ESG information that we use now only for the for the green products will be generalized, and everybody, uh, every single product around the, the financial markets will use this information because it will be key in order to assess the the, the product. My point about my my bet about the future is that the green union, the the real green union, uh, will only be focused on very specific very specific small group of, of projects that will have a real impact. I, I think that in the future, the, the green financing, the, 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 the financing in a niche, the financing in a niche uh, uh, of sustainability will be more, more close to a, an impact bond buying the impact that you are producing and pay by the financing, fin by the, the the lenders than the current approach that we have that will be more generalized and everybody will know in every single product what is the ESG performance of the things that they are investing on. Uh, this is not the case that I am not optimistic. Optimist, I am thinking that we need to evolve for, for a more impactful forms of sustainable finance. Good, so uh, 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 I'll do my, my, my bit. So first, I'd like to start with one observation. So we're obviously talking of very serious and tangible things here. When we talk of financial markets, uh, arguably global liquidity, I mean, liquidity in dollars and euros is, uh, is financial stability and central banks are key in that respect. I would like to stress that there is no such thing as a climate central bank which would inject uh, clean air or fresh air uh, into an environment. So, so we need to uh, take these things uh, uh, seriously. Um, then back to your question, uh, Jean-Claude, taking this seriously is really measuring this uh, seriously. So I think that ESG uh, ratings and credit ratings uh, will be more uh, integrated and they will use more sophisticated um, analysis instruments of ESG factors, especially for the, uh, for the E. Um, we need more forward-looking, more scientific measures of what we're talking uh, uh, here. And I'm sure uh, Jose Luis would, uh, would agree, I'm hearing him. Uh, we need more climate analytics. Uh, that means uh, uh, clear opinions. Uh, on net pledges. You've got many net pledges. What is behind? Is there carbon capture? Is there existing or non-existing uh, clean technologies? All that needs to be uh, analyzed. Also, the new business models. 
So all these will need to be refined, and obviously there will be some pressure from uh, regulators and from the societal, uh, from society. Uh, but uh, the rating agencies uh, are starting, but they need to, uh, and they're doing a great job. Uh, I mentioned that for uh, uh, sustainalytics, but uh, there's still more to come, hopefully. Thank you. So we've reached... Yeah, thank you. We've reached actually the the, the hour. Uh, so thanks a lot for, for your time, everybody. We did get three or four very interesting questions. Uh, we'll have to answer them uh, on the side over email, not to go over time. Want to thank you, everybody, for attending today. I think I saw some very high and interesting attendance rate. Thanks a lot to you for uh, uh, panelists. Very much appreciate to have you. Uh, to together with me today. Hope you had a good time and thanks a, thanks a lot and have a nice rest of the day to, to everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.